Hey everybody, uh, sorry for the last minute cancellation, I appreciate everyone's flexibility. If you hear kids in the background, it's because there are kids in the background and, uh, you know, maybe they'll make it entertaining. Um, anyway, the lecture today is going to focus on two topics. So we're covering material from chapter 7 and chapters 8, uh, model comparison and interactions. Uh, so we'll probably break the lecture up into two parts, model comparison part and interactions part. So let's dive right in. Uh, so when we're thinking about assessing models, we need to think carefully about what our goal is uh, in building out a statistical model. So if our goal is causal inference, that is we're trying to assess a causal relationship between you know, some predictor and some outcome, we really need to think carefully about causal theories, and DAGs are a great tool for doing that. Once we've uh, established a couple of possible causal theories, uh, we can determine the testable implications of those models. Uh, usually those will be conditional independencies. But once we've done that, we can evaluate, critique, and refine our approach. Uh, if our goal is prediction, which is going to be the focus today, uh, we have a very different set of tools. Um, we may not be interested in causation at all. We may be interested in understanding uh, how likely uh, it is to rain on Tuesday or in the context of criminal justice, uh, perhaps how likely uh, someone is to end up committing a violent offense if they've been arrested on some other offense if we're thinking about you know, predictive forecasting for pretrial release or something like that. So. Um, our first goal in that context is to establish what we'd like to predict, that outcome that we're after. Uh, then we estimate competing models. So we, we think about the sort of panel of variables and special specifications that may help us to understand our outcome. And then we compare uh, those models with some metric of accuracy or fit. Uh, we, we think about how well the model we've constructed or sets of models we've constructed predict the outcome that we're interested in. Uh, so when we're thinking about building out models for prediction, uh, classic danger in statistics is overfitting. Um, when we use metrics to compare model fits across models, uh, more complex models uh, will uh, always fit the observed data better than models with uh, less complexity. Uh, and so this is kind of canonically the problem of overfitting. It's really easy to perfectly fit a model to the data you observe. What's really hard is to predict data you haven't observed. So let's look at the empty cars data again. You're probably getting tired of this. There's the baby. Hello, Iris. Uh, you're probably getting tired of working with this data, but here it is. Uh, so here we've plotted the weight of the car against its fuel efficiency. So miles per gallon is on the y-axis, and we have a scatter plot going here. Um, and uh, we can see, you know, the sort of negative linear relationship that we've observed uh, in homeworks and in class before. Okay, uh, so let's think about how to model this data. The most common model of uh, measure of model fit that uh, many of you will already be familiar with is R squared, or the coefficient of uh, variation, right? Um, so what R squared does is it, uh, in essence, captures the extent of variance in our uh, outcome that is explained by our statistical model. So it effectively asks, uh, how much of the model variance that we did observe does this model explain? or how small are the residuals relative to variance in the outcome. And you can see that in the you know, top uh, component of it, the lower the residual variance, uh, the uh, higher R squared is, right? Uh, where an R squared of one indicates that the model perfectly fits the data and R squared of zero indicates that the model provides no information. Uh, so R squared is, is used all the time, uh, but it's, it's not a particularly good way to think about comparing models. Let's walk through why that is. Uh, we uh, so let's fit you know a um, model that where we where we look at uh, weight as a predictor of miles per gallon uh, here, right? Uh, so this is the model that that we've been working with for quite some time. And we can see that the R squared uh, on this model is a zero point seven four nine, meaning that uh, with weight in a linear regression model, uh, this model can 
explain 74.9% of the variance in miles per gallon, right? Meaning the residual variance of miles per gallon by weight is relatively small, right? Um, how much of the outcome is predictable? How much of the variance in the outcome is predictable based on the included predictor variables, right? Um, so this uh, is a pretty strong fit, right? Uh, weight tells us a lot about miles per gallon, but let's see what the limits of R squared are, right? So on its own, this is a useful and informative measure. Where it becomes less useful is when people use it to select which model they're going to prefer uh, because R squared has a few features that can make it really vulnerable to overfitting. So let's take a look at that. Uh, first, let's kind of pull out a sample of the data. Um, so for a linear model with weight as a predictor, R squared, uh, in this context, we're going to uh, just take the first 10 uh, our 10 random rows out of the data. And apologize for the uh, math that didn't compile there appropriately. Uh, so for that subsample, we actually have improved R squared for these random 10. So it's 79% now, but it's the same model that we just estimated, right? Where uh, weight um, predicts out fuel efficiency. Okay, so can we improve the model fit? Uh, absolutely. Um, Again, I guess this is going to be an ongoing problem with the LaTeX. I apologize for that. So let's add a quadratic, right? Uh, so we're going to fit, this is the linear function of our model. And the initial model, we had alpha plus beta 1 w. Now we're going to add a beta 2 w squared, right? And the r squared for that model is now 0 0.84. So we've uh, explained 5% more of the variance by adding that quadratic term, right? So before we were at 0.79, now we're at 0.84. Can we improve it further? Absolutely, let's add a cubic term, right? And now we are at 0 0.85, right? So we've added another percent of variance explained. What about uh, adding a fourth order polynomial? Sure, we're up to 90% now. And what about adding a fifth and sixth? Well, now we're all the way up to 96% of the variance explained, right? Uh, and I hope kind of the, the point of this exercise, right, is to illustrate that, that by adding additional parameters to the model, uh, we will explain more of the variance in the outcome. Even a variable that has virtually no correlation with an outcome will improve R squared, and this is the real vulnerability of that measure. Uh, even those pieces that don't add real information will improve fit, but those that do fit the data and overfit it, as we're about to see, also add information on the variance in the outcome, so our measure of R squared goes up consistently with model complexity. So let's take a look at these fits, right? Here's our original linear model, right? With just uh, uh, no, no polynomial terms at all, right? Now let's add that uh, quadratic term, right? Uh, so that actually might be a defensible choice, right? We can see that that does appear to be fitting the data a little bit better. Now the third order term, right? And we can see that the line kind of gets pulled down and then pulled up. Uh, to kind of approach and minimize those residuals. What happens with the fourth order term? Now we're starting to get a bit ridiculous, right? Uh, the model is going to try really hard to pass through or as close to as many points as it can, and it's dropping off the scale of observes now on that uh, fourth order term. You can see that blue line passes underneath the x-axis. We've truncated it with the range of observed values. So now it's predicting uh, values that are outside of the range of the observed data. A fifth order uh, does similar level prediction. And then that sixth order uh, starts to go pretty wild. But notice that it's passing through now most of the points in the model. And when we add a uh, seventh order, right, it's path passing through virtually all of the points in the data now. Right? And that's exactly what those uh, increasing level of polynomials is going to do. It's going to pass through more and more and more points of the data, but it's going to make increasingly less reasonable ex uh, uh, predictions for points that are outside of the data. So in this case, we've wildly overfit. But if we were just following R squared, this is the model that we would end up with, right? Because this model ver just about perfectly fits the data. The problem is it would do a horrible job at predicting new observations, right? Those data that are out of the sample. So adding complexity to a model will improve goodness of fit measures like R squared. But goodness of fit doesn't mean that we've modeled the process well, just that we fit our sample, right? 
because uh, remember what we're after here is the underlying relationship between weight and miles per gallon, not just a model that fits our sample. So adding too few parameters though can mean we aren't learning enough from the data. So our goal here is to balance complexity with predictive accuracy, right? So the, the target we're after uh, with a prediction forward approach is not fitting our data well. The target we're after is predicting new cases well, right? Predicting out of sample cases, uh, not necessarily measuring fit to our data. So we wanna think about what are some tools we could use to measure uh, fit out of sample. So a few ways we can address uh, before we kind of pivot over to thinking about out of sample prediction, let's kind of talk about a few ways we can address overfitting. And uh, one of the easiest ways we can do that is with regularizing priors. Now we've talked a lot about what good priors can do, right? Now in this context, uh, we've got three priors. We've got a normal zero one, right? And that's that dotted line. We've got a normal zero zero point five. That's the dashed line, and we've got a normal uh, 0, 0, 0.2, and that's the solid line. Now, these priors are going to allow the model uh, to uh, adjust to the data in more or less extreme ways, right? So the flatter the prior, so in this case, the normal 0, 1, allows the model some space to explore parameter values that take on uh, values you know, as high as minus 3 and plus 3, right? Uh, at the extremes, but that normal 0, 0, 0.2, this very tall peaked one, doesn't allow for extreme values to even be considered. It pushes, puts very little probability weight in uh, more extreme parameter values. So if we set priors that are relatively conservative, we'll prohibit the model from engaging in kind of wild overfitting. So let's see what that looks like. Uh, we can kind of compare two different models. One, uh, the first one, M0, has priors where we allow each parameter to sort of go where it wants. We give pretty wide z uh, normal 0, 10 priors to uh, our uh, intercept and to all four of the polynomial terms in the model. By contrast, M reg, which I'm uh, using to say M regularizing, right? Uh, we're, we're putting much narrower priors. We're saying a zero one is uh, where we think all of those parameters should be. So what this should do is it should prevent the model from returning in the posterior estimates that are extreme, right? So when we return to these initial models, we can see incredibly extreme values for these polynomial estimates, right? We've got values, if you actually go want to run the code and look at the, the model results, some of these are like minus 40, plus 37. I think there might have been a minus 200 in there, right? Very extreme values. But if we set this 0, 1 prior, and that's the widest of these, uh, a 200 or a 40 is virtually impossible under that model. And so in the posterior, we won't see those values returned, right? The, the posterior is going to be a weighted average of the prior and the likelihood. So even if the data and the likelihood think they should return an extreme value in the posterior, that regularizing prior is going to pull it way back down, right? And it's going to not overfit the data. It's not going to trust the data too much. So let's see what happens. Right here, we compare M reg is the top row in all these and M zero is the bottom row in all these. We can see for our intercept on M reg, right? It keeps that intercept relatively close to zero. It's positive, but it's close to zero. Versus in M zero where we had those wider priors, it puts the intercept up at 25, right? Uh, but we're saying, no, 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 no. We don't wanna see extreme values here. Pull it down, right? The same is true for our beta estimates, right? So for beta one, the linear term, Right, we see a relatively small but positive estimate, but in uh, M0 where we have the wider, flatter priors, we see that that term gets pushed all the way up to about 15. Right, and this pattern is all over the place. So this is our quadratic term. We can see here uh, small and positive, large and negative when we don't put those regularizing priors on. And across the board here, right, we see wider intervals as well for some of those. Now, what this is suggesting is that when we put those narrower priors on a model, it can really rein in the tendency of an overfit model to estimate extreme values, which will overfit the data, right? So if we are concerned about overfitting, 
uh, we can be very careful with our priors and uh, we can we can experiment with wider or narrower priors thinking about the possible range that values could take on and you know force ourselves to not learn too much from the data especially if we're in a context where we think overfitting is a risk so regularizing priors are a really good idea and they're one of the key advantages of a bayesian approach is that we can explicitly tell our models not to go too far okay so now that we've kind of learned some tools for how to address and avoid overfitting let's think about some methods for comparing different kinds of fits and what we might want out of methods that compare different kinds of fits. I'm gonna, so a lot of the methods we use to think about model comparison rely, uh, again, if our goal is to think about not just how well our model fit the data we did observe, but how well our model would perform at predicting data we did not observe. We might think about using a general set of tools called out of sample prediction. Uh, and so this is a method that evaluates how well a model performs at predicting new cases, right? Uh, so, you know, in general, especially when our goal is prediction, we're not interested, again, in, in how well it fits the data we did observe. We want to know how well it does with new data. Now, we don't often have new data, right? So if we had new data, uh, a lot of times our inclination would be to just throw it in the model. So what we're going to do is we're going to develop a set of tools that help us to... Uh, explore this out of sample prediction using only the data we do actually have. So uh, one, the, the simplest approach is to split the data in two and to call one data set the training set and one the test set. And on the training set, we're gonna fit our model. Uh, we're gonna hold out some pr proportion of the data. We're gonna use that to fit our model. And we're going to hold out another proportion of the data that uh, was sampled without replacement, so you can't have them in both, no, no observation is in both sets. We're going to fit the data on the training set, and then we're going to predict values for the test set and, and check out how well we did. Right. So the idea is we're going to fit the model uh, with uh, a subset of the observations and then use that model pr to predict the subset of the data that we did not fit on to see how well it does at predicting cases that it didn't explicitly fit the model to. And this is a good way to check predictive accuracy. Now this is a, you know, a, a pretty straightforward idea, right? Split the data in two, fit over here, predict over here. Uh, but we're gonna extend this to a more complex approach called leave one out cross validation that I'll describe in a bit. So we're gonna first though start with only two partitions. Eventually we're gonna go all the way up to partitioning the data up to uh, as many rows as there are in the data. Okay, so this is our six degree polynomial model, right? And this is um, fit to a subset of the data. Uh, uh, so you can see it's it's passing through, you know, many of the points exactly. I believe here I've split the data in two. So we have 16 rows in and 16 rows out, right? We can see the model is really working hard to go through as many points as it can and to capture you know, this pattern here. This is a classic overfit regression, right? Uh, the R squared on this is gonna be quite high, but it's gonna do very poorly at predicting out of sample. So let's see what happens when we predict to the test data. This is the training data. So those are the, obs the, 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 the darker, uh, bigger circles are those observations that were held out, right? And uh, now we've uh, redrawn the regression line to include predictions for those uh, that were held out. So we can see for some of these observations, right, uh, the observations on the top left quadrant, uh, we're not doing too terrible, right? These are within the range of what was already observed and they fit that basic linear pattern, so they're doing okay. But where the model really fails is here, where it makes this uh, up, upward bend and then we have a set of observations that were beyond the range of what were included in the training, not by design, just by chance. And you can see this regression line is shooting up, 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 up. So it's gonna predict that these cars that weigh five, six uh, tons are gonna have miles per gallon in the hundreds, which is not possible, right? And in this context, the error on prediction is incredibly high, right? This model does very poorly at predicting out of sample. This is a less complex model, right? Uh, so here we've fit this with, uh, I believe, a quadratic, right? And again, the small dots are the 
uh, training data and the large dots are the test data. And here we can see we're doing much better on the same test and training set of the data at fitting it, right? Reducing that model complexity uh, definitely improved our predictive power here. And we can think about that in terms of the errors between these points and this line, right? Uh, between these points in the bottom right quadrant and the regression line. The error here is far lower than the error was here, right? Where this line is off the charts. Uh, we have tremendous error there, much lower error here. So that less complex model uh, is, is giving us better predictive accuracy with the out of sample data, even though uh, it has less, uh, less of a strong fit to the training data, right? So that data it did fit to, the R squared for this model is gonna be lower. The R squared for this model is gonna be higher, but out of sample, uh, this quadratic model is gonna perform dramatically better. Now let's move on to leave one out cross-validation. Uh, this is a generalization of the method we just described and it's uh, the method we just described is often referred to as k-fold cross-validation. Uh, so in that case we use two, right? We folded the data in half and then we uh, compared our accuracy to the half that we didn't fit the model to. But we could actually extend this to the entire data set, right? So we could, uh, in theory, take our entire data set, fit a model to all but one of the rows of the data, and then examine how well it predicts that one held out observation, and then repeat that for the next row of the data, and the next row of the data, and the next row of the data. So we end up fitting as many models as there are rows in the data, minus one, uh, and then checking predictive accuracy for each of those rows, right? Uh, so again, our goal, our, our, our general method here is to define a model estimate the model holding the first observation out, predicting the value for the held out observation, estimating our prediction error somehow, and repeat with those two to n observations, right? And then we're gonna average the error across each iteration. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna get an average error for each observation in the data that we can then use to compare one model to another. So let's just see what leave one out cross validation looks like. In each case, the red dot is the held out observation. So the black dots are those that are in the model. The red dot is the one that's left out. And in this case, we're interested in predicting how far away from that regression line is that red dot, right? What's our error when we leave out each observation? And in this case, we've got a rather sizable error, but let's keep seeing what this looks like. Okay, there's our second observation that we're gonna leave out. There's our third observation that we're gonna leave out. Our fourth, our fifth, our sixth, our seventh, our eighth, our ninth, and our tenth. And you can see the regression line bounces around a bit as we hold each of those observations out. But in general, what it's doing is it's telling us how good is the model at predicting things we didn't see when we leave one of those out and how influential is each data point in pulling that model around as well. So this gives us a lot of different kinds of information. Leave one out cross-validation is a really powerful tool that we're gonna use uh, pretty routinely uh, through the rest of the course and also something that you'll encounter a lot in your uh, career as a data analyst and researcher. Um, and we have a pretty straightforward implementation of it in rethinking an R. Uh, so uh, we can actually directly do leave one out cross validation uh, with the CV underscore quap function on remember our regularized regression object mreg, right? And that's going to give us a uh, an error score, so that's a, I believe it's a deviance, uh, which if you want to see some more detailed mathematical descriptions of information theory and, and the way that we go into thinking about calculating various uh, kinds of accuracy metrics, that's well described in chapter seven. Uh, so the downside of leave one out cross validation is that we then have to estimate n minus one posteriors, right? So for a data set with a thousand observations, this is gonna be incredibly time consuming. Uh, so PSIS is uh, an alternative metric that gives an approximation of leave one out cross validation. Uh, that's L-O-O-C-V, right? Uh, leave one out cross validation. That's a little more computationally efficient and you can get that uh, in the rethinking package with PSIS, right? So this is gonna give us a score for that model. Now this doesn't really tell us a whole heck of a lot um, absent comparisons, although it will tell us when uh, the score might be unreliable because there are influential observations, which we'll see later. Okay, so 
uh, we're gonna keep going for a little bit with model comparison. We'll take a break and then come back and do interactions. Um, so here's how we would actually use this in practice, right? I've kind of set up the core ideas of overfitting uh, and model, uh, you know, and cross-validation and out-of-sample prediction. So let's kind of put this to work. How would we choose a model when we have these things in our minds? Our general approach uh, is uh, going to be that we estimate competing models, we compute some indicator of interest, and then we evaluate the relative model predictive performance across those models. Now keep in mind, this is totally inappropriate for causal inference. Uh, for causal inference, what should guide you is not predictive accuracy. What should guide you is uh, the implications of your causal theory and uh, you know the performance of the model uh, according to, to that, right? So you think about what can I test with this model? Do I observe what the causal theory says I can test? And you push there. Your goal is absolutely not predictive accuracy in a, in a causal framework, and it'll be very misleading. We'll see why in a bit. Uh, so let's kind of take a quick jump into this. And we can go back to the plant fungus experiment for uh, some some. Uh, ways to think about this, right? So from the prior lecture in chapter six, right, uh, we, we conducted an experiment or we simulated an experiment rather on the effect of some antifungal agent on plant growth, right? Uh, and remember that uh, if we add fungus into the model, right, uh, that we no longer observe a relationship between um, the antifungal agent in plant growth, right? All of the contribution of the antifungal agent to plant growth went through uh, the presence or absence of fungus. So once we knew fungus, learning about the treatment no longer provided information. Um, so as far as causal inference goes, right, the model that includes fungus in, uh, in, in the regression is totally undesirable. But we're going to see that using uh, a information criteria approach or using a leap one out cross validation approach will prefer that model that is least useful for causal inference. Okay, so we have three models we're working with here. Fungus zero, that's an intercept only model. Fungus one has the treatment as a predictor, which is the model we ought to prefer uh, if, we, if our goal is causal inference. And fungus two includes both the treatment and fungus as a predictor. So let's check this out. Uh, Right, so we're gonna use information criterion now. Uh, information criteria uh, compute an expected out of sample predictive score. So what they do in practice is uh, they take the log probability of a model, which is a way for us to describe model fit, uh, and then they subtract some penalty term, right? Uh, and the penalty term penalizes a model for additional complexity crudely. Uh, effectively, it asks, uh, you know, how many extra parameters have you put into this model? Uh, how, what are the rela relationships among those parameters? How much complexity is there in here that might be overfitting the data, right? So that penalty term is effectively penalizing you for potential overfitting. So we have the log, the, the log probability of the model, which is effectively a, a measure of fit minus that penalty term. And all information criteria work this way. You've probably seen the AIC and the BIC routinely used. Uh, they are useful workhorses in the linear regression world, uh, but as we move into generalized linear models and multi-level models, we're gonna need a different set of tools. So we're gonna use the WAIC, the widely applicable information criteria. And again, check the book if you'd like to see some comparisons of these various information criteria. But in general, uh, the information criteria is going to prefer the less complex model if two models have the same fit, right? So if we have two models that fit the data evenly well, equally well, uh, the model that's less complex is going to be the preference. And this kind of, uh, for those of you familiar with Occam's razor, this kind of fits uh, that uh, axiom, right? The idea is, you know, if we have two competing explanations, favor the more simple one, favor, favor the simpler explanation. In this case, we're going to take the simpler, the more parsimonious model uh, if they both fit the data equally well. Okay, so a lower uh, information criteria score indicates uh, a better out of sample predictive accuracy or an expected out of sample predictive accuracy. So let's compare these. Uh, so we have fungus zero, fungus one, and fungus two. 
the code for recompiling those models is in the markdown file if you want to run it. And let's look at these WAIC scores, right? Uh, we have a WAIC for fungus 2 of 370, WAIC for fungus 0 of 420, and a WAIC of fungus 1 of 421. Uh, so according to the widely applicable information criteria, fungus 2 is the best fit model, right? It has the lowest score. And uh, this actually gives us a lot of really useful information. It gives us the standard error of that estimate. But also gives us the difference of WAICs between the best uh, fit model and all others. So in this case, it's saying that there's a difference in 50 points between fungus 2, fungus 0, and fungus 1, right? So this is effectively that 50.2 is 420.6 minus 370.4. Importantly, it also gives us the standard error of the difference, right? And we can think of these as being approximately normally distributed. So if we have a difference of 50, with a standard error of 11, right? That suggests that this difference is uh, quite far away from zero, right? That 95% of the mass of this difference is between, you know, 30 and 70. Uh, so almost certain that fungus two is providing better out of sample predictive accuracy than fungus zero. And intuitively this makes sense, right? Because the way that the treatment works is by affecting fungus. but it's not 100% effective. So exposure to treatment doesn't guarantee that there's not gonna be any fungus, right? And so actually just learning about the fungus provides more information that we can use to predict out plant growth. Uh, the problem here is if we were interested in learning about the efficacy of the treatment, uh, we would be dropping all information about the efficacy of the treatment by conditioning on fungus, right? Uh, so uh, the most accurate model in terms of prediction is fungus two. But again, if your goal is to think about causal relationships, because fungus is on a pipe, if we remember back to those DAG structures between the treatment and plant growth, uh, we're effectively discarding all information about the relationship between the treatment and plant growth when we condition on fungus. So you have to think really carefully about what your goal is when you use these tools. Information criteria don't care about causation, right? They only care about prediction. PSIS uh, does the same thing, and we can, uh, you know, specify that we want the PSIS, which is the approximation of leave one out cross validation. Um, uh, that uh, you could specify that using the compare function. Compare's default is to give you WAIC, but we can tell it we want PSIS quite easily with func equals. Uh, so we're going to do uh, the same comparison, and according to PSIS. Fungus 2 is still the most uh, the best predictive model, and we still see a quite uh, quite large difference that's reliably different than zero. Um, now, PSIS uh, has an additional benefit that it will warn you when there are, because it's approximating that leave one out cross-validation, so when it sees an observation that's uh, really pulling the model up or down in a particular direction, it's gonna warn you that the score may not be reliable. Uh, and the book has a great discussion of using robust regression as a way to handle uh, uh, modeling data that may have uh, extreme outliers. We can use the student's T distribution instead of the normal distribution, which has fatter tails. Uh, and that can be a really nice tool for when we have uh, data that has, you know, some, some, some cases that fall far from the regression line. Uh, in general, don't drop observations, right? Uh, that's a, a, a technique that some people may uh, endorse dropping extreme observations, dropping outliers. Don't do that. Instead, per, pursue alternative approaches like robust regression. Okay, we're going to take five here, and then I'll come back and do the second half of the lecture in another file. Thanks.